Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here from the Overflow Room and on the road with Richard Strauss. And no, I'm not going to recommend like a big long opera or a whole bunch of tone poems. No, not at all. This is a purely or- piece of orchestral music, just orchestral music. And it's 141 minutes or 146 minutes and 41 seconds. So that's what, two hours, 26 minutes, and 41 seconds. That's a lot of Strauss. Holy mackerel. That's like a ton of Strauss, isn't it? 60, 60 is 120. Let me make sure it's, I'm not crazy. Yeah, that's plenty of time to travel most distances. It certainly got me to Connecticut and then back again, because that's about a 90-minute trip, and you can go back and listen to some more of it. And then it's just lovely to have in your in your car stereo system. So, how do we get Der Rosenkavalier, the orchestral version? Well, what this is, is a two-minute, two-minute, two-hour and 26-minute and 41-second film score. Because in 1926, someone had the bright idea of turning the entirety of Der Rosenkavalier into a silent movie. And that was 14 years after the premiere, so it's 1926. A very, very bad piece of timing, because the next year, talkies came in, <laughs> and and the silent movie Rosenkavalier vanished. Kerpoof! Gone! It was gone. It was a complete waste of time and effort. Strauss himself seemed not to have been all that interested in the project, but then again, Strauss didn't seem to be all that interested in almost anything he did. I don't know how much of the, the apocryphal storytelling we can take from it. But he did it. That's the point. He actually did it. He worked with his assistants or whatever he did, but he did it. He took De Rosenkavalier and he remade it as a film score. And the film was made, was shot basically around the film score, although the movie doesn't really correspond in many respects to what we heard in the opera. I mean, just think about it. Think about a typical Strauss opera. There's all kinds of plot business that he gets through as quickly as possible, and then all the action stops dead, and for the last 20 minutes, all the characters stand around doing nothing and sing. Well, that wouldn't work terribly well in a silent movie, would it? I mean, can you just imagine the the final trio in a silent movie? You have these three women, or one woman dressed as a guy standing there, going... You get the picture, right? Wouldn't work. So it doesn't in the movie. In fact, in the movie, there are a whole bunch of extra characters because in a movie, you can do things that you can't in the opera house. The most important of them is the field marshal, the husband of the marshal in. He shows up. (laughs) He's around. He does things. He comes in at the very end and affects a reconciliation with his dear wife. He has a chat. He has a chat with... With, with with what's his name, who's what's her name, who's dressed as what's his name, you know? I mean, Octavian, that's the guy, girl, guy, whatever. And they have a chat, and it lasts exactly 34 seconds long in the silent film. Here it is. And then the final trio is actually the reconciliation scene between all of the characters. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's Strauss. It's gorgeous. They reorchestrated, you know, some of the bits to give the melodic lines, the vocal lines to the wind instruments. And and, and you get to hear just two and a bit hours of unbelievably beautiful Strauss strung out end to end. There's also there's also some other stuff that he stuck in there because he needed extra stuff for the extra characters. He wrote a new march, which he put in here, and he also inserted one of the dances from his Couperin dance suite, the Virbaltons, which is just lots of fun and very pretty. Here's a little bit of that, too. Thank you. 
charmant, n'est-ce pas? So anyway, Strauss made this opera setting in 1926. He actually conducted it with full orchestra, um, not terribly well synchronized to the movie. In fact, in a few places, originally, apparently, Strauss told them to stop the film so that the music could catch up. And he did it in Vienna, and he did it in London, and a couple other places. And then the entire thing disappeared. There was even a, a version of this whole sucker made for Salon Orchestra, which was recorded by Ensemble 13 Baden-Baden on Deutsche Harmonia Mundi. That thing is long gone, long out of print, which is a pity. It was a wonderful thing to hear, you know, a, a wheezy, tiny little salon orchestra play this music, because so much of it sounds like salon music anyway. It worked very, very well. I wish all of Ensemble 13 Baden-Baden's recordings would come back. Deutsche Harmonia Mundi, whoever has, I think, I think BMG owns that stuff. Wouldn't that be interesting? But that's, I, I'm digressing. The point is, it's it's just vintage Strauss that you could play in your car, and it has a nice range of contrasts, and it's very, very, as you know, very pretty. Some would say it's saccharine. I mean, it's very sweet, um, given the subject matter. And you hear all of the familiar tunes that you're used to from Rose and Cavalier, plus a few extra bonbons and goodies. So what's not to love? It's fabulous. This performance is on Capriccio, which is why I can play you bits of it. Um, it features Marek Yanofsky, um, and let's see, what's the orchestra here? I think they tell you what it is. Yes, the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra Berlin. It's still kicking around. I've seen it recently on Amazon, although you may have a hard time recognizing it. It comes in a slipcase with this sort of silver thing that reflects badly on my stage lighting here. There's, there's like silver, and this is what it looks like outside of its slipcase. Two full discs, and you can download it, which is what I did. I just stuck it on my iPod. And I have it. I have it whenever I'm driving. It works fabulously well. It is also, I might add, if you remember, we did our talk on opera without words. Wow. Holy mama. This is the opera without words mother load. Where else are you going to find the complete opera soup to nuts without words? I mean, it's, yeah, okay, maybe there's like, you know, an hour or 45 minutes of music cut from it for the purposes of doing the film but it's incredible. Now, there have been supposedly some performances of this restored, you know, with the film, but the entire film doesn't exist anymore. Supposedly, I think the last 15 minutes or so are missing. I've never seen it, so I can't tell you. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. I mean, most of it or however much there is of it. The director was the same guy who did that famous silent film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, so it's, it's a major thing in cinema history, although I have to say, um, I have enough trouble dealing with my music history, so I don't do cinema history, which is, you know, it's a fascinating topic, but it, it's not my fach, so I'm not sure about the whole filmistic history of it. The interesting thing about it, though, apparently, is that Hoffmannsthal drew up a whole scenario for it, which the character, which the director completely ignored, and they substituted their own, because neither Strauss nor Hoffmannsthal had really any clue about the potentialities or the the, the exigencies of the film medium. And so they weren't really geared for it. But what we have is this, this wonderful, wonderful two hour, 26 minute and 41 second manifesto, this m memento of Strauss's brief encounter with the wonderful world of the silent cinema. And boy, does it make great road music. I can't think of a, a, a Better if you like Strauss, if you like your late romantic stuff, and driving, <laughs> if you put those two together. This is just fabulous. So give it a shot and keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.